Today we're talking to Lisa Curry. When we hear Lisa's name, certain words come to mind. Swimmer, wife, supermum, businesswoman. She is all of these things. In many ways, these titles are the chapters that have made up her life. And like any life, some chapters are wonderful and some are unexpected. With the loss of Lisa's daughter, Jamie, two years ago, she is learning slowly how to navigate and embrace the next chapter. I think this is something that many of us uh, will connect with. Please welcome Lisa as she shares very openly and authentically about navigating life and the chapters ahead. Lisa Curry is a name I'd argue that 99.9% of our listeners need no introduction to. Lisa, you and I'd have to say the real OJ, Olivia Newton-John, have been two of my greatest childhood idols and mentors growing up, even from afar. Um, it is such an honour for me to be talking to you today. I don't know who was more excited, me, mum or dad, but oh. we are all here. And uh, and being a Queenslander, you certainly have played a huge part in, in my life from the very beginning. So thank you for your time oh, today. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, I've been around for a very long time. <laughs> And, it, you know, one of the funny things for me is to, um, is when I look back, you know, I've been in the public eye for now 40 years, which is a long time. And sometimes I wonder, you know, what I've done to, you know, allow me to have that privilege of being in the public eye for that long. But, yeah, I've been around for a long time. Some people love that and some people can't stand me. So... <laughs> That's okay too. You've covered so many different aspects of, of, of life um, in the beautiful book that you've just written, and congratulations on this. I know it will be the first of many titles of yours to come, Lisa, A Memoir, 60 Years of Life, Love and Loss. And the way you've broken it into chapters really are, I guess, those, those chapters of your life from mm. Lisa the Child, Lisa Curry the Golden Girl, Lisa Curry Kenny the Super Mum, back to Lisa Curry again. And now you say it's just time to be you, just time to be Lisa and to find sort of peace and contentment in that. Do you even know what that might look like yet? Um, I can imagine what it looks like. But all those chapters in my book, to be honest, I could have written a book on each of the chapters. Um, you know, there was so much that went into each chapter and so many stories and uh, so many stories that we had to cut out of the book, in mm -hmm. fact. Um, but when I look back on some of those chapters, they are just a moment in time in your life. For example, my, my swimming was a moment in time. And my outrigger canoeing was another moment in time, but they all add up to create this life, you know, that you've had. It's all been really good and, um, you know, slight, many sliding door moments and I wouldn't change anything though. Mm. I, you know, I used to have one regret, but I don't regret anything, you know, in my life. Everything happens for a reason and, you know, many doors are opened and if, a door doesn't open, it's not your door. So you just, you know, keep searching for what you want. But I think the most important thing is to have fun along the way. Lisa, it's one thing though to have the gift, isn't it? It's then being able to put that into play every day and have the dedication and the drive. I mean, you can say that a lot of kids have a great gift, but not many of them have that drive to succeed and to get up at 5am to sleep in their swimmers mm -hmm. and to push mm -hmm. through and, and do the hard yards. I've seen that so many times with um, people that I've coached, um, with people that I've seen when I'm sitting with my kids training, that there are so many talented people around, but the one thing they, they lack is the internal drive to, to want to be the best every single day. And that is relentless. And it's sometimes seen as selfish as well um, by other people, but it's something that is in you like I I believe that's that's a trait that we have inside of us and if you don't have that it's very hard to make it to the top um you know I, I said to my son Jet and he's a he's a really good swimmer I said I really think you could make an Olympic team this is years and years ago and he said to me mum I just don't love it yeah and there's the answer you know you have to love it you have to love getting up at 4.30 a.m. and, you know, and who and does? yourself. Who does? That very small minority that then also have the drive and the gift uh, to do it. It's, yes. Yeah, but then you have to back up again in the afternoon and then you do that 12 times a week. 
every week until you have a break. So, and you don't get very many breaks in swimming. You know, you get a couple of weeks off after each major competition, but, you know, all in all, you really don't get very many breaks. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can see from the millions of people that train around the world why there are only, you know, 12,000 or so that represent their countries at the Olympic Games every four years. And out of those, there's only about six or 800 medals. It's very, very hard to win. I heard a great quote recently from a gentleman that I interviewed, uh, Chervine, who does Symbiotica supplements. But he said, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And I think particularly of, of you when, when I hear that quote, mm -hmm. because you have done everything to the utmost, you know, I, I think you don't leave anything behind. There's nothing in the tank in any project that you've mm. taken on. Would you sort of agree in, in that idea that the way you swam, the way you trained, the dedication that you gave, you've given that to every single aspect of your life? It, it's extraordinary. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never heard that before, but it's, it's very true. Um, you know, even if I do something minor around the house, like if you make the bed, do it properly. If you vacuum, like vacuum it properly. I, I You know, it's a half-made bed to me does my head in because it's not done properly. If you're going to do something, just just do it right. And, and I think that goes back to that, that guy and what he said. Like it's very true and I've never thought about my the way that I do things in that way but I, I guess, um, well, my husband would agree that I, I do things like that but um I don't know. That's, I guess, just how we're wired. And mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why, you know, some people are quite happy just being where they are and some people, you know, want more. And if you want more, you have to give more. You have to work harder every single day. And I often talk to groups um, about you know, primary school children these days and everyone's a winner and everyone gets a ribbon because everyone's a winner. It's like, well, no, you're not. You came first and you came last. You know, what are we teaching our children? Mm -hmm. And if we're giving them all a ribbon, you know, who are we satisfying? Their parents? That my kid got a ribbon today? Well, that's great, but what does it mean? He came last, you know. So if little Johnny wants to come first, He's got to do the work. So we're rewarding our kids for mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is that the right thing to do? Because once you leave school, once you're in the big wide world yourself, you soon realise that, you know, if you want something badly enough, you actually have to do a lot of work to get there. It is not handed to you on a silver platter. And it is about finding your own path, isn't it? Whatever that is. I mean, as you say, little Johnny might not be the best sprinter on the paddock, but boy, he's going to have a skill and a drive and a, mm. and a you know, a real passion for something. It's mm. up to us, I guess, as parents um, and friends and relatives and grandparents to find out what that is mm. and perhaps put our own desires and drive and expectation aside like you did with Jet. Okay, so he doesn't want to be a swimmer. Yes, that's mm. sad because he's got this great gift, um, but what is it that he really loves and, and helping him find his passion? Yeah. I spoke to a um, geneticist one night um, at a dinner. I was sitting next to him and we were talking about genetics and he he said, you know, you don't, as a parent, you don't often pass down your ability for swimming or surf lifesaving or music, whatever it might be, but you might pass down a, a gene for passion and desire and drive. So if you can, if you can grab that, and like you just said, little Johnny might be an amazing artist, you know, you've got to find your own path. And just because your parents are teachers or doctors or sports people, means nothing it doesn't mean that you're going to go down that same path you might if you love it but if your parents are forcing you to go down that path and they don't love that path they're not going to do it well so you, kids have to find their own way they have to find their own path and as parents it's it's, it's our role to um, support and encourage them um, and even Morgan when she was dancing you know she said mum that you know the Moulin Rouge is like my Olympics. It's, you know, it's her Olympics every single day when she got up on stage. 
how do you advise we go about finding what what drives us when perhaps our kids have found their own passions and and they've left home or as yours have got your, their own children now what advice do you give Morgan for saying hey just just let your boys be free yeah cuz um you know each child is different too they all have different ideas on what they want to be and where they want to be in the world and that's what I mean as a parent you just have to support and encourage them and um but as you get older you know you your um passions change your desires change um you know I've worked so hard my whole life um we've recently just sold our property we were running retreats and weddings and you know as great as that was and that was a real goal of mine for a good 10 years and then once we started running it, after about a year, I just thought, this is not me, you know. The hospitality sort of industry, <laughs> it's not me. And I just found it um, really full on. And plus my, my directions and my feelings changed about a lot of things as well in the last couple of years. But, mm. you know, you just, things change and it's okay. it's okay to stop doing what you're doing and try something completely different. It's okay to do that. There's a big wide world out there and you have a certain amount of time on this earth. So what are you doing working in a job that you hate? Why don't you go and do something you love? You know, you might take a, you know, a cut in pay or something, but you get an increase in life. So, you know, it's all of these questions that we need to kind of ask ourselves, where are we going? So I think now for me it's time for me to, um, you know, just focus on helping myself. Um and my husband and I want to travel um, with and without our puppy and, you know, I've got a few great things coming up and being there for the kids and, you know, I think um, it's okay to it's okay to think about yourself for a while. A quick you must try it pause. We have been busy putting together gift ideas to make the gift giving season easy. So if you're buying for teachers, your bestie, your mum or the teenagers in your life, even your partner, we have some fabulous ideas. Think beautiful perfumes, body oils, organic teas, candles, exfoliants and so much more. Go check out our gifts page on youmusttryit.com for more. Now back to the show. Lisa, you've had a lot of evolutions um, in your life, I'd say, and one obviously from being the professional athlete to then being someone who was so driven to help others find their health and wellness. I would say you were, I guess, one of the forerunners of personal fitness and training here in the country. Um, and you would have seen obviously the explosion of that in the years gone by. But what was it that drove you to make sure that other people found that love for wellness in their lives? Well, I guess it came from my own um, issues with my own health. Um, and now that we know that my years and years of training, not only in one sport but in two sports, the consequence of that is now catching up with me. But 30 years ago, um, you know, I started to feel really moody and tired and cranky and I might have put a hole in the wall once in the house. It wasn't from my hand. It was from a doorknob though. Um, but what I didn't know that I had hormonal imbalance and my now business partner had talked to me right back then um, about how I was feeling and what was going on for my body. And he said it was because of the, you know, massive amounts of training and time and intensity chlorine in your system as well, um, pregnancies, childbirth, living, working, stress, food, like all these sorts of things. And, you know, my hormones were up and down and, you know, long story short, that's why we started our company, which used to be called Happy Hormones, but it's now called Happy Healthy You. So I was able to get my hormones under control. And then as I got older, other things started happening to me as well. And I'd say, can you formulate a product to help, you know, A, B and C? And he said, yeah, I can. And the more we started talking about it, the more people would say, oh, my goodness, that's me too. Because we never talked about these things. They were sort of seen as taboo, women's issues. Men would say, la, 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 I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to know about, you know, your hormonal issues. 
I don't want to know about your moods. All I know is that you're a cranky old cow sometimes and just leave me alone. So, <laughs> you know, it's all the things that we do in our business now is um, sort of a, a consequence of talking to the ladies that are talking with us every single day. Like we have um, over 500,000 women who are talking to us, telling us their concerns. And so we've been able to formulate this company and all of our natural products to suit the women of this country and overseas as well. So it's been like an evolution of the things that have gone wrong for me in my life. I feel like I've, you know, had so many things that have, you know, been great, but also so many things have um, not been so great. And as you get older, they all seem to catch up on you. Were you surprised when that happened, knowing your body so well and having been in tune with yourself for so long, when it just started to to go awry and, and be that erratic? Did that shock you? Did you think you would be one of those ones that would go, no, 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 I know myself well, I know what I need, I know what I'm lacking? Um, yeah, was it a surprise when your body sort of took over? <laughs> yeah, it was a surprise and just recently um, an absolute shock. Um, 2008, I have I've, I've got a defibrillator pacemaker in. So, um, and then even in the last six months, I've been hospitalised twice with AF, which is atrial fibrillation. So, from all the years of training and sport and intensity, not only in one sport but in two sports. So, when I finished swimming, I spent another 20 years in ultra marathon outrigger canoeing, which is four, five, six hour races for 20 years on top of my swimming career. So the consequence of that time period is um, because my heart is so strong and has beat so hard and strongly for so many years, it's kind of like stretch marks, I guess. So it stretches and it creates scarring on the apex of the heart. The electrical system can't penetrate that scarring. So I have an electrical problem with my heart. So therefore the AF... um, my heart rate was about 150 for 10 hours and now I'm on beta blockers and um, blood thinners for stroke prevention and one doctor actually told me I had a heart attack. I nearly had a heart attack because he told me I had a heart attack but then he said I didn't have a heart attack, it was an electrical problem. And I said to him, if I knew then that the consequence would be this now at this age, would I have done it? Would I have pushed myself so hard? And the answer is yes, I would have done it. I would have done the same thing because it's what you do. So now as athletes are growing into their age, you know, their 40s and 50s and 60s, you know, we now know that there are consequences from pushing ourselves so hard not that we would have done it any different way. So you've got your weekend warrior athletes out there who are probably saying, yep, you know, I do sport on the weekend and I have a beer and, you know, and I'm going to be great. And they probably will be because they haven't, you know, smashed their body their whole life. But you know what? Um, As my four-year-old grandson says, you get what you get and you don't get upset. So this is, where we are, it's what we do, and you just manage your health as much as possible. So um, we talk to all of our ladies in our in our Facebook groups about this all the time. Uh, so I think one of the main things that we have to think about with our health, I think the, the main thing is food. You know, we have to eat well because gut health is showing to be the most important thing with Um, lots of um, illnesses, with mental health issues. Um, We've got so many um, young children and young adults with um, eating disorders and it's the the gut-brain connection. So food is the most important aspect of everything that we do in our life. What we put in our mouth will either give us health or it'll take away health. It's a very simple equation really, isn't it? When you look at it that obviously, and the work that you've been doing um, with Happy Healthy You has obviously led you down this path a long way into that microbiome uh, arena. How do you keep your energy levels now? What is it that Lisa does now to look after herself? So my health is 
almost at rock bottom now um, for me. Um, and I have to rebuild myself. And the interesting thing is I know exactly what I have to do. I know exactly what I have to do, but you have to be in the right mindset to start. And that's why we always talk in our groups about baby steps and just doing something small each day that's good for your gut, that's good for your health, that's good for your mind and soul. Um, and believe it or not, one of the things that I really enjoy is um, now I sound old for some reason, uh, is I like gardening. <laughs> I like mowing the lawn and, you know, keeping everything pruned and nice because I think, you know, when your surroundings are clean and uncluttered, you know, including your house, your bedroom, your kitchen, your garden, your car's clean, like everything just feels Everything feels better. That's me. Like some people I know don't mm. give a shit about a dirty car. I do. Um, or the grass is too long. I, you know, I like to see it mowed. Um, so I, I like to get on the mower um, and I like crafty things. You know, I love crocheting. Uh, we're building a, we've got a shed down the back and I'm painting it all pink soon. It's going to be my like my craft area and you know, I've got all Jamie's beautiful things that will go into that room and, you know, it's kind of like my little sanctuary. So instead of getting up and saying, right, I've got to go to work, what I like to do where I'm heading is I want to be able to get up and go, you know what, I'm just going to potter around today. I never get a chance just to potter around and that's where I'm heading. And that will be a completely new mindset for you, won't it? Not because of, of the past, of the way that you have driven yourself, but just giving yourself space and time to heal, as you say, from what you have been through in the last couple of years is something that we all um, have have ridden with you in some way, Lisa, and I hope you know that the whole, the whole world feels for you and your family now with what you've been through, but the voice that you're bringing to mental illness and challenges as well has been extraordinary. Um, I know in the book you talk a lot about about Jamie and her journey um, and the resolve that you have there that perhaps you don't feel every day. I'm sure there's a lot of um, emotions in that, but what you've been able to put on, on paper um, about accepting Jamie's journey is... is it's going to be so helpful for so many people who will find themselves in, in similar situations, either with themselves or, or with family members. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for being so open um, and and so honest about that journey. And I think that's a gift that Jamie has also been able to give this world to, to help us all understand a little bit better about mm. mental illness um, no matter who and, and where and what angle that comes from. So I, I'm really, really grateful on, on behalf of all of us, really grateful you're able to express that so beautifully in, in your book and, and in interviews that you've done. Yeah. It was it was hard writing the book because I didn't know how much to share. I didn't know whether, like I wanted to honour Jamie, I wanted to tell her story in a way because she, you know, if you're honest, that's all, uh, to me, that is everything. Honesty is everything. You can't sort of, you know, cover things up and sweep things under the carpet. And so I wrote with honesty and and I knew that that was okay. I knew Jamie would be okay with that because I know that she wanted to write her own book anyway. She said, Mum, when I get through this, I want to write a book to help people. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had a friend of mine who does freelance um She's a freelance journalist and she was going to write with Jamie, but we, we never got that chance. Um, so I actually have, it's really funny now, I have all Jamie's diaries and I've only started being able to start looking through them. And, you know, even three years before she died, she actually wrote in her diary that, um, you know, she was getting heaps better um, she didn't have cirrhosis of the liver anymore, which is strange to me that was strange, but, but she was in a rehab situation there. And then a few days later, she was saying how much better she felt. And then the diary stopped. 
because her boyfriend at the time passed away. I mean, how how much more can a kid have piled on top of her, you know? Mm. So all these little things that I'm now reading in her in her journals, um, not that they're piecing together her story, but they're making more sense. And she used to say, Mum, you just you don't understand how hard this is. And as much as we tried to, we never understood how hard it is because now when I am grieving and I'm sad and traumatised, it's only a small amount, I think, of what she was going through every single day for over 15 years. I mean, 15 years and more, and some people have it their whole life. So I know that some people recover from what they're going through. I know that people live with what they're going through every single day. They struggle. It's just a struggle to live every day. And I know that there are people like Jamie who just couldn't get through it and who don't survive. Um, So... There is help out there for people. I know that what I have said has helped people because they've let me know. It makes it easier for me to know that it is helping other people. And I think Jamie would be really happy that, um, you know, she has affected a lot of people because there's a lot of Jamies out there. And I, Grant and I both, we want Jamie's life to have mattered. Um, And it will. Mm -hmm. It will in some way. But I also have to be conscious that I don't focus my life on Jamie and what happened to her because I have other children, you know, and I want to continue being a good mum for them. I want to continue being, you know, um, a fun granny. Just want to make sure that, you know, I have the energy and the love and passion and enthusiasm and drive for my family. I don't want that to stop and not be able to give it to the other kids and and grandsons. You've said no one lives a life full of sunshine and we have to remember even the darkest nights end, the sun will rise and everything will be okay. And I say that back to you now, Lisa, because I know there are going to be dark nights again and again and everything will be okay. What daily practices and, and rituals do you have now? Is that Has that become a bit of a mantra for you moving forward? Um, sometimes when things get a little bit tough for me, I just think everything's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Um, and I think it's important to, um, if you need to cry, to cry because holding it in is not good for you. And sometimes I can be at a coffee shop just having what I used to have, a coffee, um, and there's not one day that goes by that I don't think about Jamie and something can come up and I can be in a coffee shop and, you know, it's just you don't cry. It's the tears just fall out of your eyes. It's different. It's, it's just like this constant stream of tears. It's not like crying when, you know, it's half crying, half not crying. It's different. And I can be sitting there and I'm sure people thinking, oh, God, what's wrong with her? But it's just this thought that's come up and just automatically happens. But I know that you have to allow that to happen because that's that's stress release as well. So I'm very aware of all those sorts of things. And, um, um, yeah, like it's just this is, this, is a different, this is a different path for me now and it's, it's different and I haven't got my head around how to live my life in a different way as yet. Um, it's been two years since Jamie passed away and um, I'm starting now to, until I, until I talk about it, I'm fine. When someone says to me, are you okay? And then I'm not okay. <laughs> If you have to talk about it, then it's hard. But generally speaking, I'm doing okay Um, and starting to plot my new path um, to whatever I'm going to be doing in the next, you know, hopefully 30 years. That's it. I'm sure ageing well has a very different meaning for you now than it did, um, you know, in the last five years. Yeah, I mean, ageing 
comes in different forms too, like ageing as in your energy levels, ageing as in, you know, what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to, you know, keep doing fun things, which comes back to looking after yourself and being fit as well, you know, to climb mountains and to do hikes and go for walks um, and ageing in the way that you look as well. And, um, you know, the way you look, the way your skin looks, the way your eyes are bright, your hair, everything comes from the inside. And, you know, that's, that's a big priority for us in our business is to create an environment on the inside of the body which can allow you to look and feel and do, you know, everything that you want to do in life. So the next 30 years for you are, as you say, going to look different and feel different. I hope you're still excited by the idea of what that brings. And and at 90, as you say, just finally cutting loose and letting it all go. Maybe don't wait till 90, Lisa. (laughs) No one's going to hold it against you if you suddenly start living a completely different life than the one you have so far. I think uh, it's time for you now when, when you're ready. I don't know. I just, I, I'm not quite sure where I stand at the moment, you know, with everything I'm doing. I, like I said, I'm just getting to the point where I can start to function again. We all, um, you know, put our lives out there on social media. Everyone knows what everyone's doing. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I love that because someone who's always had such a clear path and seemingly to us, as you say, you've been such a, an inspiration to so many. I think this is, is that as well. It's okay to take a breath and it's okay to not know what comes next. And it's okay just to sit in the moment for a little while. Mm. It's funny though, because it's a bit, it's not scary. It's kind of frustrating to not know what your path looks like. It's like Alice in Wonderland, you know, she's walking along the road and she comes to a fork in the road and she doesn't know which way to go. And the Cheshire cat is sitting up there and she says, I don't know which way to go. He said, well, where are you going? She said, I don't know. And he says, well, it doesn't matter which road you take, but at least go one way, you know, and then it might fork off into another way and another way. And It might be not up and down, it might be sideways, it might be curling around, it might be a you know a U-turn or a 360, and but you just don't know, but just keep moving, don't stay stagnant. I think that is the worst thing for our health, for our mind, body, spirit, is to sit in one place and do the same thing over and over again and wishing for a different result. So we have to take that first baby step and move forward. Thank you, Lisa. I think that's a beautiful note to finish on today. I really appreciate everything you've given to us over the last 40 years. I know um, as much as you may feel the pressure of us all watching you, you are a true inspiration always. And, And thank you for living so openly and honestly for all of us. So many takeaways from today. Many doors open. And if it doesn't, it's not for you. It's not your door. How about finding your own path and passion and helping kids do the same? Certainly makes sense. I also loved what we put in our mouth will either give us health or take it away. It's it's so simple when you break it down like that. Baby steps. Do something small each day to support your health. And just simply, everything will be okay. Keep moving. Don't get stagnant. Thank you, Lisa, for spending your time with us and being so honest, so authentic, so much of the Lisa that we know and we we love. Uh, We look forward to chatting you and finding out the next chapters of your life. Please forward this conversation to anyone who you think could benefit. Hearing other people's stories does matter and it helps us connect more than we realise. So thank you again for joining me for another story in the Ageing Project off-season. I'll catch you soon.